the Living 1982 podcast. Were you into the punk scene in the very early 80s or someone who discovered the genre along the way? Well, we're doing some deep diving into the Seattle punk scene and sharing the story behind a band that was very short-lived but made a lasting impact with members going on to being in some of the biggest bands in the world. Their debut album was never released back in the day but is finally out now. This is the story of The Living. In fact, right. on, on today's episode of the Living 1982 podcast, we're joined by Greg Gilmore, the drummer from the Living 1982 session, of which our talk is about to begin. How did you end up being in the Living? I, I, I uh, at uh, back in 1982 in Seattle, we had a magazine called The Rocket which was uh, the, you know, local music tabloid. Well, a mm -hmm. local entertainment tabloid, actually. It wasn't, it wasn't, yeah, open but, music, but um, you know, it was, came out, I think originally it came out once a month and then uh, after a while it was, was twice a month. Um, and, uh, and one of the, one of the things that they had which was very useful was musicians classifieds and um i believe they were free i think so yeah. i'm not sure about that but i think i think maybe they were free up to a point or something like that and um my own band the fastbacks who were always in need of a drummer were no stranger to putting ads in the in the uh, rocket classifieds once and we almost started making a joke about it like if anybody was like uh, really following it, it would be like, once again, uh, we're in need of a, a drummer must uh, like play fast music and arrangements. Um, and so do you remember what your, the rocket ad that you responded to, what it, uh, what it, what it said? Uh, no way. I don't remember at all. But yeah, that's, that's really a great question. That's really good. Because I, <clears throat> that makes me curious now. What was it? Something about it, you know, it. stand yeah. out from all the other similar ads. Yeah. And of course, back then, you know, in the in the, the beginnings of the the local metal scenes, it was always, uh, you know, uh, uh, good attitude required, equipment and hair a must, or something like that. Right? Wasn't that? That kind of the joke about the ads, you know, you got to have, you got to have, you know, uh, professional gear, professional attitude, uh, gear, a must, you know. And, uh, that's right. You're so good at that. Yes. I, yeah. <clears throat> and Looks of course, equipment and, and attitude were important in ours, but it was like, uh, you know, some a particular kind of equipment and bad attitude. <laughs> <laughs> you know the, the the equipment was such that you know maybe no drum cages and a bad attitude and uh and that's about it do you have an official tally for the number of drummers that played with the fast packs no, I don't. Um, it hasn't changed in the past 20 years because <laughs> we haven't done anything. Yeah. Um, I, I, you know, it could be, it could be researchable. There is a, uh, the Fastback Superfan, Scott Lee, um, did make a, a pie chart of all the different drummers and um, the amount of music that each of them had recorded. Mm -hmm. No, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily reflect uh, the live performance right. uh, or amount of time spent in the band because some, some drummers were in for a long time and, and had little released music. And then some drummers were in for a short time and had much recorded music. But anyway, I'd imagine there's got to be about a dozen, you know, over the, over the 20 year uh, span. Yeah. Greg Gilmore, uh, never actually in the Fast Max, but we did practice with you once. It was close, yeah. In the basement yeah. of that, uh, it must have been the... Uh, uh, the house where Lulu and, did Kim and Lulu live there? 
Yeah, yeah, sort of uh, Wedg Wedgwood E. Yep. It was near Duff's parents' house, correct? It was out there where, yeah, everybody lived and came from out yeah, there yeah. at the time. Yeah, yeah, and I remember, I remember, uh, you know, Duff's parents, Duff's, at least his mom, uh, just lived down the street. Yeah. Todd's mom, that where the living rehearsed when I, where I <laughs> met them and first joined, was out there. And okay, so you 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 uh, you respond to this ad in in the rocket, and you know, some, you called called them up, of course, because you talked on the phone. There was no other. Would have been it. Would have been the old telephone then, probably oh. a touch tone at least. Yeah, yeah, maybe not a dial because no. you know, those may have been out at that time, but uh, yeah. out of favor in the way. Um, and uh, whoever you got on the phone, John Conti or, you know, Todd or, or Duff. And yeah, I don't know. I'm guessing it was probably John, mm -hmm. most likely. And uh, so, yeah, I dragged my drums over there like we used to do. Black Rogers kit. But at that time, I, I went to this phase, you probably remember, using a couple of, they were both Ludwig snare drums that now, today, in retrospect, sadly, I modified and was using them as uh, mounted toms. Oh. Remember that? They were white. I'm, 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 I guess I, I sort of remember that. Yeah, yeah, yeah cannibalized Ludwig snare drums. Oh. I still have them. Um, I wish they were the snare drums that they once <laughs> that they were before I went at them with drill and spray, spray can. But uh, yeah. oh. well, you know, if you have time this week, you can you can fill some holes and the you know the, if it's if it's uh, you know spray paint over a uh, steel finish. You could probably get that off. No, it was some, both of them were a, a variation on some a classic, you know, perloid wrap. They just, they were just cool from, you know, in every way. Um, yeah, yeah, cool in every way. Now, um, yeah, a couple little uh, uh, timbales, if you need them. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> So you dragged the drums down to uh, was it was it uh, Todd's parents' basement? Yeah. Yeah. Walk up to the door. And there was a little bit of a, you know, I don't. The way I'm remembering it, a couple of you know one or two steps from the from the door down to where I would have been standing in front of the door and Todd, who is an imposing figure anyway you know, opens the door, blue haired. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I was, I remember being slightly taken aback. Whoa. Uh, but that was it. Well, how about this? <laughs> yeah, that was it. They're all very affable, and friendly. And I hardly remember anything about, you know, playing but it ha it was, you know, it happened pretty quick. It was, let's do this. Or you want to join? Or? Yes, I, I can imagine. Um, you know, once you started playing, it was probably clear that, oh, you know, whether or not they tried out other people before that, I I don't know. I should uh, should ask if there was if there's other people, because I mean, there again, remembering our own uh, my own drummer issues and and rocket and people would seem like they <clears throat> had a grasp on, you know, what be was back then underground music. It was not, you know, it was still, even by 1982, it was not music that was heard in the bars and, you know, coming up in the, in the you know, seven or eight years later where people were used to hearing original music in clubs and stuff like that it was and this was you know pretty hard-edged and pretty radical music for the for the time for 
people that were listening to new wave music and you know re, you know they were not it was it was still it was still something different so a lot of the people that would call up were you know in our in our minds holdovers from the old guard they were you know people yeah. who dun, 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 Da, 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 da. Well, I went downtown and I, you know, did this. And, you know, we're looking, you know, it's like, well, so uh, how many, how often do you guys gig? You know, do you take in some money? It's like, no, you know, like, and we started putting all our ads in the rocket at that point. So it's more negative than positive. It's like, you know, got to have an okay drum set. We're not a gigging band. We don't play in bars. We don't play covers. We don't do this. We don't do this. Don't do this. Don't do this. It's like, you know, because people would call up. And I, I I believe I told you once that, you know, one guy even called up that that played the flute, too. And he was, uh, he was, really? all, well, yeah, maybe, you know, in one part of a song, uh, you know, like if if it doesn't need drums, you know, I could come out from behind the kit and, and play a little flute, you know, solo or something like that. It's like, whoa. And we're just like, you know, originally I thought, you know, you're crazy. And then I started thinking, well, it's like, well you know, certainly Genesis had, uh, you know, some flute solos and things like that back then in in the, you know, the, the early to mid 70s and stuff. And I thought that was cool. But it's like, are you paying attention? This is not, has nothing to do with that kind of music. It's not, it's not that. Um, so we, you know, we just like laughed like, no, no. And even it got to the point where people would show up with their drum set and bring it. And we'd like, you could tell just by looking at the drum set that the guy wasn't going to be right. You know, that. The, yeah. Yeah. It's um, and you know, too many funny people. symbols and too many drums. <laughs> yeah. And then ultimately, you know, once you get the, once you get the meat and potatoes of the style down, then, you know, add the funny upside down symbols in the, you know, the weird stuff, it's fine. Or, you know, little Roto Toms. I was looking at uh, uh, the Fastbacks 1982 video from up at the Com Commodore in, in, in Vancouver. And our drummer Richard has three Roto Toms. <laughs> you know. Oh, did you really? Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, grounds for ridicule for sure you know but at the same time looking back it's like you know what that kind of rules <laughs> you know it, it's really bold for somebody in a like a, a kick-ass punk band to have have stuff like that and, and pull out like, that kind of equipment yeah um, yep. so anyway you're down there playing with the living and it's 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 duff and and uh, john conti and, and and todd fleischman and this in his mom's basement and uh yeah, yeah todd's mom's yeah clearly you guys played some songs and and but yeah this is cool and and then what happened then i don't i mean we just started uh rehearsing and it seems like we did it frequently um Right, right, as as you would, um, because yeah. I mean, we, we I know that we don't know when what the date of your um, you know this audition was necessarily. We don't know exactly when it was. It had to have been you know probably very early 1982. Yeah, um, you know, I was thinking more about that recently, and that um, Chris Edding had left in our last show was sometime in December. Right, right. I have, I have a, uh, a December 11th show at St. Joseph's Hall, Silly Killers, The Living in the Fast Facts, with Chris, and the little thing I have says Chris on drums. Yeah. So that was uh, December 11th. Uh, yeah, whether, I, knew, uh, I, remember, I remember seeing Oh, sorry. Go ahead. What? Oh, I don't remember the, if that. I don't know for sure if that was his. If that was the last show that they did, but. Uh, right. Well, then. Um, it's uh, it's so strange to me now. I'm, imagine. 
most people have this experience with aging, but uh, when I look back on that period and realize, uh, from my perspective now, I, when I think of all the things or all the significant moments in my life that were happening then, I think well, that had to be a period of you know some years because uh, that's how long it takes for significant things to happen. <laughs> when you start teasing this apart and realizing, oh my God, the living lasted for just a few months. Right, right. If I you're, if, if, you're a a year. Year, if you if you went down and met those guys in January 1982, which you know could have easily been January or, or February or like, and the last living show that we know what uh, uh, is um, Roscoe Louis Gallery, uh, July 30th, 1982. So that's like eight months tops that yeah. that band existed and never, th that combination of people, I don't believe ever got together again. Not like, that, no, not, we, we carried on without John, but we attempted to for, um, but it could not have been long, you know, I don't know, a couple, couple, a few, couple, three weeks, mm -hmm. maybe, and before seems that we were all just in that moment feeling like the pool is drained and yeah. Which seems and weird. It seems like, mm -hmm. uh, you it know, does. in hindsight, it seems like the seeds of a dynamite band could, yeah. uh, have been there but um and it was you know and it was and that's another aspect of growing up a, a little bit uh, is, maybe, is not uh not seeing something great that could be um, yeah understanding that well this is rather than a time to just bag it and go do something else this is a time to just knuckle down and persevere a little bit <clears throat> because it almost seemed like back in that era you know, things so often worked so great with so little effort. Like, I mean, you showing up and, and playing, I'm sure, you know, I wasn't there, but I'm pretty sure I can imagine what it was like. It was like, wow, it just sort of had a mind of its own and it took off and it was great. And <clears throat> yeah. as, as a, a lot of really great things in the rock music world, you get together with, you know, three or four people start playing some music and bang, it's just like, oh yeah, you know, maybe we could use a little fine tuning, a little a little rhythm section, you know, clarity or something like that, but everything's there and it just sounds tough and, and exciting. And if it doesn't, it's really easy to just ignore, you know, move on. Just because walk. you're you know, like, yeah. oh, we're great. So everything, so you think that everything that's good should be very easy and work great instantly. As things were then also, you get together with a combination of people and you'd be playing a show two weeks later, you know, like instantly <clears throat> shows weren't booked four months, five months, six months in advance at local clubs as they are now. You know, you could have a band and call the person who books shows at a club and say, oh, or at a, you know, at the Metropolis at all ages or, you know, wherever it would be and say, oh, yeah, uh, we've got this band and it's, 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 it's cool. Okay, well, yeah, why don't, uh, I'll come down, you know, next Wednesday and there's a show. Okay, and you go to the thing and make some flyers and tack them up and tell all your friends and you'd get, you know, a couple dozen buddies down there and, and you know things were were, were quickly done, um, which is not the case anymore. But then, if you think, oh well, we can well we can be a three piece band, and you try it, and maybe you practice once, and it's it's like oh this isn't exactly lighting up the the basement. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. Like, oh, give up and do something else <laughs> you know well there's so uh, we did that for you know uh eight, eight months now time to move on to something else i guess i mean 
Yeah. Yeah. Oh. And that's all I all I kind of remember is that feeling of just the three of us at practice one day and just the the air the feeling in the room was uh, just the kind of it's it's just uh just gone what uh, what made you think it was time to go record like you know was it just something that that you know because uh, back then too like nobody had home studios nobody recording was not yeah. simple or inexpensive or easy it was, it was a bit of a, yeah it was a bit of a commitment wasn't it yeah, it was, you know, and, and uh, but I think there was studios around. It was, you know, it was, it was possible to, it was possible to do that, but it was not, you know, it was always more money than anybody had. Um, yeah. You know, so was it, uh, maybe it was Brian Fox idea to go record or was it, were, were you guys just like, you know, let's, let's take this to the next level and, uh, and, and record these songs that we have. Yeah, you know, I have no recollection at all of how that came about. I, I do not, I definitely don't remember any group conversations about what should we do next. <laughs> Ever a conversation like that. Such right. Language. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're either arguing about how a song should go or, you know, playing or... <laughs> Figured out how you're going to get your gear downtown. Right, right, right. How are we going to get down to the gorilla room? <laughs> um, <clears throat> okay, well, what do you remember about the actual recording session, which was at American Music, which is a, a guitar store here in, in, in Seattle, or a music instrument store, but they also had a, a studio. Um, which yeah yeah what is now the what is now the drum department there that oh that that's really, what the recording studio was in the building there yes that was the studio classic eight track I uh, I don't I'm guessing half inch mm -hmm. probably yeah maybe a a, a, four, was a forty dash four I think was the uh, the classic uh, classic half inch eight track. At that time, yeah. I, I never went there, although the the living recorded there, the Silly Killers recorded there, uh, their their forty five was recorded there, as well as the Veins, um, which was Duff and Chris Edding and Andy's band from nineteen eighty. Oh, really? They had been at that same. I don't. I don't think I was aware that all of those bands had used that same. Yes, yeah, so all, all those all those things were recorded there, and and. You know, I don't know why I never, because I'd go to American Music, it was the music store of choice, you know, at, at that point. And if there was a recording studio, you'd think that being a recording aficionado, I might have at least tried to poke my head in there or gone while you guys were setting up to. Well, you did, though, when we were mixing. Duff got you down there as a, you know, some sort of um, a advisor at one point for one moment at least you yeah, say okay well i don't remember ever being in there but i'm, I'm pretty but sure I, I also you know that everything i remember is not uh, particularly accurate I, <laughs> I, I can relate to that feeling yeah, yeah, but yeah. yeah you may not have ever recorded there but you at least uh, that uh, that is one thing i'm really sure about yeah 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 you, yeah, yeah, yeah. You were there at least for a you know, briefly to kind of okay. give us some some support or perspective on the right because the, the original mix of the living 1982, if I remember correctly, was uh, a little bit skewed against the singer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Like, well, I can tell there's a singer in there somewhere, and I you know getting a lot of guitar. Um, you know, which which sounded cool, but at the at the same time, it's like, well, you know. Um, so you guys go in there. Maybe you record most of the songs on one on one day. It's an eight track studio. I'm sure it was very quickly done. Yes, yeah, for sure. That was a it was you know an afternoon work with tracking. 
and then did you record vocals on the same day? I know that you went back and recorded a couple more songs a few, you know, a little while later, not, not probably not too long later. Yeah. No, the first five songs and they are the first five songs on the record. They were done at that first session and everything was recorded in a day in an afternoon. Mm -hmm. and we were just, we were really ready to go. Now, so you were given a digital transfer of these session of these of these two uh, two recording sessions, which you mixed to give us the the record that we that we have now. Yeah. Um, I'm guessing, uh, you know, there if it was an eight track, where if the drums were on two of the tracks, or maybe three, three, kick, snare, and everything else. Oh yeah, okay. So snare drum and uh, stereo, everything else. Pretty sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, of course, yeah. that was a, a common way to do that if you had, if you had three tracks and uh, wanted a stereo drum mix, that would be the way to go. And um, oh no, it was I. Um, three tracks, kick, one snare, two and mono, and rest yeah. of key. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I, yeah, pretty sure. Which ultimately is better for from a remix standpoint to have the kick drum on a separate track. Versus yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, and you spent a little bit of time down in the basement. Oh, I don't know where you where you're. Uh, yeah. It's in the old basement. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, was that was it fun to uh, to revisit that uh, nearly. 40 years ago uh, <clears throat> thrill of the earliest known recordings of Greg Gilmore? Uh, it was actually, it was a lot of fun. It was so much fun. I did it twice. That um, the, I, I don't even remember now how far back this goes. It, it just seems like a good 10 years nearly. You know, we, this all came up quite a while back and we were going to release the record and I mixed it. And then that didn't, that broke down. And then maybe I was doing it just for my own amusement, not really being happy with those mixes and having no no deed no outlet for them i still i just sat down and sometime later and started to play around with mixing them again and uh then we had another deal and those mixes were going to be used for that but anyway the uh whatever it is now three or four deals later the record is finally coming out and so this is the second the mixes i did originally are not we're using yeah i did it again yeah right, right. Again. And, and you know not unheard of in the uh you know the current state of recording where you can you know go back and pick up where you left off or start new but i mean it's it's possible to do that in a way that of course wouldn't have been so possible back then if you know 10 years later to do a remix i mean you really have to start from the from yeah. the ground up um and you know it's it's fun you know it's yeah. cool to, the, to old recordings and and you know try to do what you can to you know not necessarily enhance what's there, but present it in a way that sounds like it did then. To, yeah, sort of uncover it. Yeah, and what was what I did when I went back to mix them the second time. Uh, you know, I didn't have. I might have come up with. Either I found one myself or I got one from somebody, a cassette from of the original mixes. Mm -hmm. 
which obviously by now just it sounds you know so it's it's so deteriorated it's uh that sounds awful but i had already without that in my mind i just a, re a memory kind of of what the mixes had sounded like to me then mm -hmm. and uh i did try to listen to a, a cassette whatever that is 40 35 years later to try to reinforce that memory and it, it may or may not have it's hard to say but i did i when i went back to mix them the second time i was just i was really trying to work with the way i had remembered them sounding rather than um you know reimagining them right right and, and you know today. the beauty of an eight track or even a four track recording is you know there's other than purposefully ruining things by slathering a bunch of you know digital reverb on it you know they it's it's pretty easy there's there's you know so much of it is sort of preordained it's baked in yeah there's kind of right. and especially and an, you know an eight track studio back in 1982 is not going to be loaded with outboard gear and of course back then you know, you wanted all that stuff. You wanted the the AMS reverb and you wanted, the, you know, the, you know, you wanted all this fancy stuff and, you know, you wanted gates on all the toms and you want, you know, all these things that, but I mean, you didn't have them. And so you just did the best, you know, like the stuff you'd hear about, it's like, oh yeah, you put, you know, gates on the toms and do, 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 do. And, you know, that's cool and everything, but in an inexpensive studio you just don't have them and if you know if if you're recording all the drums to one track you know you can't really do that because if something triggers wrong it's printed and you're you can't you you can't go back and i know that's probably not yeah, that to the layman who might be listening to this but you know it was very it was very important back then i mean you do anything you can to get a killer sound in a studio because you wanted your recordings to sound like you know killer you know like british punk bands or you wanted them to sound like the germs album or something with it that everything was well recorded um and there was two things going against you the least of which was the equipment the most of which is nobody had any experience doing anything and nobody was really good at anything but you know, you'd hear the records and you'd get frustrated when your record didn't sound as good as theirs and you'd start like, ah, 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 you know, yelling at the engineer. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying you guys did because yours turned out fine. Um, but, uh, but uh, you know, you just get frustrated and it's like, well, why doesn't it sound like this? Oh, and, and not, not the least of it being, you know, your own ability in the sound. Cause you didn't, yeah, because you didn't play it like that. <laughs> yeah, you don't sound like that. You're not playing like that. And, uh, you know, you know, there's 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 a full detachment between you know, your band and not your band, but other bands and the uh, yeah yeah technology and, and whatever. So it was frustrating, but the uh, but that studio ended up like the living uh, the living the Silly Killers record sounds great, the Veins record sounds great. You know, whatever they were doing there, Brad, uh, what was his name, Brad? Brad Spur. Brad Spur. Um, you know, for you know, he must have had a pretty good, he must have had a pretty good uh, style, you know, because he made it happen. He, yeah, yeah, he was real, he was, he was real good. So he did, you think he did all of those other recordings? Well, they were there. all done at that studio. Now, I don't know if there was somebody else there that yeah. uh, was, was an engineer, but they all, they all have a, you know, a sound of, you know, somebody knew what they were doing because yeah. for sure the veins stuff and and Chris's band of, of early 1980 certainly couldn't have had a clue what they were doing, you know, and for them to walk out of there with three songs recorded for their single that, that sound as good as they do, you know, somebody there must have been, uh, you know, pretty good guidance yeah. and, yeah. Uh, um, um, you know, I mean, those those guys were eight or sixteen years old. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. 
and it's not like they had you know their parents there you know old older wiser parents like well when i was in a band we used to do this and you know i want to do this for my kids and stuff it was nothing like that there was no parents at that session <laughs> it's just a bunch of bunch of dorky punk rock kids you know in a studio with a guy that that made it happen and you know that was a rarity back then you know because usually that you you'd, the band would start playing and the engineer would go oh god this is terrible you know, first stop the so hard and turn the guitar down you can't record with that much distortion on a guitar. You know, those things really did happen um oh, yeah. and uh yeah that's the well, that's the same similar that pet peeve of mine that there was a time when a snare drum could not was not allowed to ring for a recording. You had to you have a wallet or something you can tape on that thing. <laughs> oh, please. <laughs> uh, you know, I can, I can, I can, I can dig both sides of that story. You know, like a douche, you know, snare drum or a clang kind of. They're both, both are good. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, yeah. you know, it's like. Cool just not you know not understanding what the whole sound of something is supposed to be like is is bad for the engineer because unless they just you know put mics on it and say well whatever whatever you guys do you know whatever you put in those microphones it's on you yeah 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 i'm just here to put the microphones on I'm not here to make any decisions it's like and you know i understand that too but it's like like, oh, you know, you could make this a little bit better by, you know, actually tuning those toms so that they don't just go, Puh, that they actually, uh, I don't know, so things that you could do or, yeah, hey, oh, maybe I'll stop and tune that guitar a little bit, you know, or something like that, you know, just helpful. Get in, helpful. Yeah, yeah, just get involved. Too. Get involved, yeah, the, the E string and yeah. the bass is totally, you know, not in tune up the neck. Give me five minutes and let's adjust it so it you know plays in tune a little bit better I mean, you know like you know the caliber of gear that people played on back then was generally a uh, pretty uh, low caliber it's questionable yes <laughs> and you know to be able to reap a little bit of uh, quality out of you know falling apart breaking i know there's a there's a romantic side to that. Oh, it's like, yeah, we just played crappy gear. I mean, and a lot of times crappy gear just sounds crappy no matter what you do. But if, you know, if you can get it to sound pretty good, then you're, you're, you know, not necessarily. Yeah. Depends on what you, depends on what you do with that crappy sound. You know, yeah, if, yeah, you're, yeah, yeah. if you're owning it, then hey, you're going to make something happen. But <laughs> Honing it, and, if you just play and then well, that's what comes out. Then yeah. <laughs> prospects are not high. And after after the living sort of just you know stopped. Did you do? Did you play with anybody else? I know that you came down and practiced with the, the fastbacks once. Uh, because is that when I came came? It over must to have been because. Uh, our last shows were the same show, which was, uh, you know, ba ba our, our last our last show was Monroe's Dance Palace with DOA and the Living, which was June, I think, 19th, 1982. And after that, uh, our drummer Richard and our other guitar player Lulu uh, parted ways for reasons unknown. And uh, and so that Roscoe Louis show, which was July 30th, was our record release show, right? Which we originally weren't going to play at because we did. It was it was only me and Kim, the uh, guitar player and 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 bass player, singer. Um, so we didn't even have a whole band. So it's like, well, uh, let's still do this record release party, and with well, the living will play, and so that ended up being that and then then our uh our lulu and richard the drummer and other guitar player both decided that they would bless us with their presence and come to the show and and play some songs so we did and you guys played 
and that was and that was the last time the living played a show and as far as i know and um you know we were so we were all sort of out of you know every everything had kind of you know fallen off the the merry-go-round at that point the wheels were off and and um i believe I, I believe that i mean that would make sense if that was the time that you you know came down and and yeah yeah would have been in 1982 at some point wow well, ex except i it seems i i came over more than once is that possible and because i'm remembering and lulu i don't or yeah lulu was gone then too because i don't Lulu was there when I came. Well, there, okay. I think Kim and Lulu lived in that house together. I mean, they were both they were both there, and it was you know there was you know parties all the time. Yeah, but she, uh, yeah, I'm, when we were there, when I was there to play. Oh, Lulu was, I see what you mean. She was she was there because I remember <laughs> when you and Lulu would start going at it, and then Kim and I would drift upstairs and hang out. Yeah, for a yeah, while. yeah. I, I remember that 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 basement practice room was just it was it was it was bad news. I mean, it was just like so much fighting, arguing for what reason? I don't know. Yeah, I guess but, I should clarify. I should clarify that what I mean by going at it is that that you guys were at loggerheads over some. Yeah, yeah, over over <laughs> some something. I don't want to play that chord. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's not a song though. <laughs> Well, I'm just not gonna play it. <laughs> That's stupid. You're stupid. Oh, I love that. I love that kind of that dialogue, that band, those moments. Uh, I'm not. Well, I'll just won't play that note then. I just yeah, I don't play. like that note, so I'm just I just won't play on that section. I just right, right, which always is fine if you just don't want to play for a little while. <laughs> It'll sound better when you come back in, but. The, but that was never the reason for not playing. It's like, I'm not going to play on that part because I don't like that chord. And I, I think you're stupid. So, okay. So, I mean, it's just not, this is not appropriate to the living particularly, but it makes a lot of sense that our drummer may have bailed. Lulu's still being in the band. We get you down there to, to practice once. It It doesn't really like, take off as you know as we were really talking about it like things either just launched and were perfect or they weren't and yeah. uh and so me and kim go upstairs lulu and i are down in the basement practice room arguing and yelling at each other and maybe that was that maybe that you know around that time she may have just said i don't need this i don't need all you know because i don't know i don't really know why she ended up not being in in the fastbacks at that point but you know we were clearly not so angry with one another that we didn't do two more shows while we were broken up <laughs> yeah it was the fall of 84 when duff and i went to la uh duff was he started talking about it first he was he pitched the idea to me and his <clears throat> that was his view was you know we've done it here it's, we gotta go go to where the action is right 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 and um so we did for me, it turned out to be action that I just really couldn't, I could not <clears throat> connect with that place. And the, the, the business there it wasn't, at least then, that was not the right place for me to be. But, and um, then I did not play much for a while you know maybe some random odds and ends i don't no regular band thing and yeah that <clears throat> might have been a couple years then i went uh i went on a long one-way ticket 
traveling backpacker trip to Southeast Asia for months, and then when I just right when I came back, I ran into Stone walking around up on Broadway. We didn't really know each other. I think we were barely acquainted, but <clears throat> he invited me to come down and play. That was the beginning of that. Left my love bone. So, um, yeah, there's kind of that uh, that gap in there after I came back from L.A. Right, right. And, you know, like, I could imagine after banging your head against the wall and not getting anywhere for six plus months down there, <laughs> been a little bit, uh, you know, frustrated and disillusioned, perhaps. Yeah, you know, I don't, um, I don't really remember processing it much, but, um, <clears throat> Yeah, already in that short time, I do remember that. I mean, I was not fully, I wasn't disengaged or unplugged from the, I was going out and I knew what was, I came back and I saw what was happening by that time, Green River. In fact, I did, there was a little bit of resurrected 10 minute warning, maybe, in that time after I came back. But then by then green river was happening would that have been also when the human were kind of a thing like i made a record with homestead or yeah yeah i think that would have been eight you know 85 for sure yeah 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 by that that you're thinking christmas you know just getting getting the years mixed up but it seems like you know, 85 was maybe the year that the U-Men did that. And, you know, 86 must have been sort of the, the like the Green River U-Men homestead records, you know, put out records by both those bands, I believe. That's right. Green River did something. Too, yeah. They're on the shelf. <laughs> yeah. Like that. Yeah. In that, so in that time, something had evolved. Something had, had changed something significant the last maybe sort of the last piece required for those earlier bands to finally connect with the the world at at large i mean not that uh, not that that uh, the living and certainly the fastbacks weren't playing songs certainly were but then it, like 10 minute warning represented another thing that wasn't i mean we called what we we're you know we called those they were songs but they didn't have choruses for you know like it, it was it was music it was it was rock music but it was a little less song based than you know the other bands were for sure yeah. and when i came back i maybe typified mainly by say what Green River was up to, like suddenly, okay, this whole thing has grown up a little bit. These guys have moved it to the next, the next iteration closer to doing that thing. You know, they had the sing-along chorus, which is, you know, a requirement. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Living 1982 podcast. Circle back for weekly episodes and find out about each week's special guests and where to stream the music by following the band's release on Instagram at the Living 1982.